the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamer, Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Aminadab, Aminadab begot Nation, and Nation begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab, Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon begot Rehoboam. Rehoboam begot Abijah. And Abijah begot Asa. Asa begot Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat begot Joram. And Joram begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham. Jotham begot Ahaz. And Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh. Manasseh begot Amon. And Amon begot Josiah. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, and Shealtiel begot Zer Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel begot Ab Abiad. Abiad begot Eliakim. Eliakim begot Aser. Aser begot Zadok, Zadok begot Achim, and Achim begot Eliad. Eliad begot Eliezer, Eliezer begot Mathen, and Mathen begot Jacob. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. Thank you for your word, Lord. We got through it. So I love family trees. How many of you, how many of you, do, you have like 23 in me or something? Or ancestry DNA? Okay. Not that many people. Um. There are apps that will show you your genetic makeup, but they're really just overpriced DNA kits. Um, they don't do much. They only give estimates about geographical locations that you're most likely coming from based on comparing DNA or data in other people's genes. So despite the fun of them, they can't really tell you who you are. They can't tell you about the lifestyle of your, those who came before you, your ancestors. They can't tell you what your grandfathers did. They can't tell you about their gifts and talents. They can't tell you about their personality and their faith. A genealogy or a family tree, however, it does help us actually understand who people are. So a family tree, a genealogy, is a chart representing family relationships in a conventional tree structure. And in the Bible, we have 25 of them. The one we read today comes at the beginning of the Gospels. At the beginning, the start of the New Testament. And it's really important. It's curious that the word, the word in the Greek for genealogy is actually Genesis. It's not the beginning of Jesus, of course, because Jesus has always existed. But this record shows what leads to, well, the beginning of his time in an earthly body, in a human body on earth, and, and what became a new covenant and then what all of the new creation will be and is. So in that way, this family tree at the beginning of Matthew is going to be able to tell us who we are in the end. Now, many of us skim over the genealogies. How many of you are guilty of that? I'm going to raise my hand first. I'm not going to lie. 
I've skimmed over them. I'm like, okay, this is good. You want to get to the good part, right? After all, those, those are hard to pronounce names. You know how many times I had to practice that and write them phonetically to do that? So, um, God put these lists here for a reason. And they are no less important than the other scripture. All scripture, all scripture is God breathed. 2 Timothy 3.16, even a long list of names. Now, of the 25, there's only two genealogies in the New Testament. Without going off on a rabbit trail, and Paul actually warned the church about getting too crazy about genealogies, right? But just for a background, Matthew's gospel is written to mainly Jewish Christians. His genealogy traces the, the legal descent of the house of David following Joseph's line. Remember, Jesus did not come from Joseph's biological seed. He was by adoption his father. Luke's written to the Gentiles, traces, and it's not at the beginning, it's, it's later on, traces the biological descent from Adam following Mary's line and that bloodline. So Jesus was a real baby. That's good news for us. He had a real mother. He had a real family tree, just like we do. And this tree or this genealogy, it sets the stage for the nativity story, which we'll read tonight and celebrate. So for the Jewish Christians, Matthew writes to, they're wondering if, he has a purpose in this, they're wondering, is this Jesus the true Messiah? We, we, have, to, we have to see proof. So Matthew wanted to make sure that they, the, the Jewish Christians, or any Jews who were going to come to Christ, would fully understand that Jesus was a true Israelite. Descended from David and Abraham, and, of course, the rightful king of Israel. So there are, in this genealogy alone, deliberate Jewish evangelism methods that are found within the tree. If you compare them, you'll notice that Matthew skips it three generations, and the reason for that is they're tied with Ahab, and they're tied with evil, and they're not belonging to that royal line, something we don't put much thought into, but the Jews would have. So looking at the list, it's really interesting. It's divided through 42 generations. So there's three sections of 14 and multiples of seven. Now, this isn't a mystical Bible code. There's nothing, like, secret about this. It's not a recommendation to go read into this all over the Bible, but there are some things with numbers, and we find them here. And the reason Matthew did this was to help those Jewish Christians remember, memorize the genealogy. So they remember where Christ came from, his royal lineage, and, of course, descending from Abraham. So 14, interestingly enough, is the sum of the three characters in the Hebrew root for David. And that would help them remember who the son of David is. The ancient Jews had a system of value for Hebrew letters. We, once again, we don't really do that. And remember, it's not a secret Bible code. It's just a way for them to remember, hey, this is the rightful heir to David's throne. So Matthew does this on purpose. He is intentional with every name. He's intentional with how it's arranged. And of course, most importantly, he's led by the Holy Spirit. So let's start with section number one of the 14 this morning. The first part goes from Abraham to David. Of course, Matthew starts with Abraham. Abraham is the man from whom all the Jews descend. But through him and this line were promises of blessing, not just to the Jews, but to all nations. Genesis 12, 2. Here's a promise. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, 
and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 22, 18, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. Jesus Christ is that seed. Jesus Christ, through which all the nations would be blessed, technically, actually not technically, really, it's, it's why if, if you're a Christian, you sit here in this room. It's coming from this promise. So the Jews who are reading this, this Gospel of Matthew in this section, they're gonna see some, they're gonna see some radical things in this genealogy. And that's why if we skip over it, we're not gonna understand. You're gonna see great patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, men of great reputation. But then if you look closer and you study. And there's some people of, of no, no really reputation, but there's sorcerers. There's people involved in scandal. There's some who are not even Jews. Not only that, there are Gentile women in this genealogy. Tamer, a Canaanite involved in a serious scandal. You can go look up the story for yourself. Rahab probably better known, a Canaanite prostitute. Ruth, a Moabite. And then after this section, we even have Bathsheba, the, the wife of, of course, she's, she's not mentioned by name, but that's who she is, the one who David sinned with. Women had low social status back then. And, you know, I want to say that we're completely free of that in our modern day, but I don't, I don't think we've completely been free of that with all that goes on with, with, with trafficking and things like that. But it's, it's a lot better. They were not usually included on lists like these. If you look at Luke's genealogy, he only has men. But all of these women are put there on purpose because in their stories, you'll see that they were non-Jewish women who were somehow redeemed by the grace of God and used for his purposes. So it's like already in, in this family tree, you see the gospel plan unfolding. You see that promise coming of all nations being blessed. God is saying through this that he can use anyone for his purposes, regardless of their past, regardless of their bloodline, Gender. So this is already pointing to what the early church would be formed in. Led by men and women, Jews and Gentiles, and people of all nations. So there's no doubt here that Jesus comes from Abraham. But something else that's very important, Jesus Christ had to be a legal heir, royal heir to the throne of David. This was amplified through this genealogy. So the next 14 generations is from David to the exile. <coughs> King David. Remember God's people, God's people, where we're supposed to be ruled by God alone. They were supposed to be set apart from all the other nations who had to make their own kings and, and rulers. But they begged for a king. 1 Samuel 8, 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, but we will have a king over us that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. So the Lord said to Samuel, heed their voice and make them a king. Saul comes, and he was a failure. But then came David. And David, from Jesse, remember, a little shepherd boy from a, a really not so significant family, but he became a great king 
He wasn't perfect, but he was definitely a great king. He was a, uh, a writer of many of the Psalms. He was a musician, a poet, a worship leader. He led great victories in battle, a military leader. He brought Israel to the height of power. But more importantly than that, he was given a promise. He was given a covenant promise by God that from his line, from his seed, would come a king to rule forever. And we see that here in 2 Samuel 7, 12. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Partially fulfilled in Solomon, of course. Completely fulfilled in Jesus Christ. This is why there's so much controversy, not to us, of course, we're modern readers, but to call, even have called Jesus the king of the Jews. Because of what it, what it meant no one could be the Messiah without having legitimate rights to the throne by being a true descendant of David. So after David was king, what happened? Well, the family tree really began to, it was at its height with David, and then here we go, we're going downhill. And it descended into chaos. The leadership failed. The list that you read in these, in these 14, in this section of 14, it shows all the kings of Judah. Now, most of them were bad. Some good. Asa, Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah were okay. We had some good and then bad, um, like Solomon, right? So, but the others led people into sin. They led people into immorality, and they worshiped false gods, amongst other things. Eventually, they led the Jewish people into exile instead of victory. The list ends with Jeconiah, who was dethroned by Nebuchadnezzar as the Jews were going into exile. Side note, he was cursed in Jeremiah 22. You can read about it there, so that no blood relative from him could sit on the throne of David. Jesus, however, was not royal by blood, from Joseph's line, he's only royal by blood through Mary's line, so he is not cursed, and it can't affect his rule. So from a lineage of good and evil kings, Jesus Christ is born. God's plan went forward. Nothing was going to stop that. And for us, no matter what history we have, because we all sit here with family trees, God can break through, and he can work out his purposes for his glory. Now, many of us come from a history of good leaders and bad leaders in our family, right? You think of your fathers, mothers, grandfathers, whatever, matriarchs, patriarchs. I'm sure not everyone's really super good. Maybe some of you have experienced curses from family before. Maybe you have some curses in your family history that you're not too proud of. Well, Jesus came not only to break the cycle in his, in his own family tree, his own family history, but ours as well. God will use anyone. He will use anything, any ruler, any evil ruler, any good ruler to work out things for his purposes. So that's what we learned from these kings. The, the royal rule is going to continue, but we're not done yet. We have one last section, the last section of the 14. And this goes from exile to Jesus, from exile to Jesus. After Jerusalem was seized, Nebuchadnezzar deposed Jeconiah. He installs Matt and Yahu, and then switch his name to Zedekiah to lead, but he was, he was an evil guy also. The kingdom of Judah is destroyed. 
The Jews are scattered. They're exiled. They're wondering, where is this promise of the Messiah? Where's, where's, the, where's the king who's going to rule forever? And then there was silence. When you look in your Bible, you can, you can kind of see the silence right before Matthew. The last Old Testament prophet to speak was Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. If you notice the last verse of the Old Testament, uh, Malachi 4, 6, make sure I'm right. Yeah, okay. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Wow. So that last, the last thing before the silence, the last thing the prophet Malachi says, is a, it's, it's a, a thing about restoring families. And then, boom, we come right into the family tree of Jesus. But during that 400 years, a lot happened. A lot The world changed. We have Alexander the Great. You have uh, Antiochus, these Antichrist-like figures. The Maccabean Revolt. Uh, Rome rose up to power, right? Invaded Syria. Ruled Israel. Set up a uh, Herod the Great, who's really a puppet king, who's half Jew. Um, They were still waiting for Jesus. This wasn't a good time. Many had probably given up. And many, many Jews especially did not expect Jesus to come the way that he did. The way that we magnify at Christmas. And that's because he came in a not so impressive way. And if you look at the last list of this, these 14 generations... I think it's really the least impressive. I studied every single name. It took me a long time. I had never actually done that before. Zerubbabel is probably the most famous. He was the governor of Judah after the exile. He helped rebuild the temple, um, trying to revive the kingdom. You could read all about him in the book of Zechariah where you hear him receive these famous words that most Christians are familiar with, I think we even have it in one of our bathrooms on the wall. But it says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. So it's a powerful story. But after him, the list of names in the genealogy of Jesus, I have like question marks by them because they're like, they're basically no names. Little significance until you get to Joseph and of husband of Mary. So Jesus' family tree had people without a powerful testimony, had women involved in sexual scandals, um, people who experienced trauma, pain, suffering, great leaders, bad leaders. I think it covers every aspect of who we are as human beings. And at this low point in low point in Jewish history. Jesus comes and he's born in a lowly situation to give us hope. All of us hope. All nations, all people, all who trust in Jesus Christ can have a new spiritual family tree. Like, now. It's really, it's, it's, it's absolutely, it's, it's a new beginning. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. And the old is gone and the new has come. So it's a new genealogy. It's a new family tree. And this is really exciting. For me, it's, it, I see the anticipation in my children. And I love giving them gifts. And I was, I was hearing what Alyssa said and pondering while I, was, while I was worshiping, and I was, I, was, I was kind of praying, but then kind of dis, like trying to discipline myself in my mind. Lord, how, how can we anticipate you as a child anticipates the opening of gifts? 
Can we have that kind of excitement? And the answer I basically got is that, it, well, it, it should be that exciting. It should already be that exciting. And then the question, isn't it that exciting? We get to be a part of his family. We get to be a part of his kingdom. That's why this is the beginning of the gospel. That's why this is the Genesis genealogy, the beginning of the new creations in Jesus Christ. It is the history of the plan of God, and it is a, a plan to restore what has been broken. We may have ties to our past. We may have, we may have some messed up family histories. I know some of you do. You know I do. Some of us think that the past controls us or that we're destined to repeat the mistakes of our fathers and our, our grandfathers or whatever. And in some cases, those very things are what people have been telling you your entire life. you will be just like your father. And if that's a bad thing, then that's a bad thing. You are, you're gonna be just like them. He was a liar, you're gonna be a liar. You have this, you have, I mean, it, it, it just goes on and on. And we, we, somehow we lose sight of the fact of what Jesus did when he came in a family tree to break through and make up for where we lacked and where we sinned and then pay for it, and it just goes on. So we get discouraged when we look at our histories, maybe. And then you'll say, well, you don't know, what, you don't know where I've been from. Or if you have trauma, trauma, if you have trauma in your life, I, yeah, I know what that's like, absolutely. We have serious trauma. There's things that do carry on uh, into families, and it's even, it's proven genetically, it's called, I think it's called epigenetics, and I don't have all the science in my mind right now, so I can't tell you, but it's like trauma is passed on, which we kind of relate that to the Bible for sure, because the sin carries on. But Jesus, Jesus Christ, he takes care of all this. The power of what the child Jesus grew up to do for us, it breaks through our messed up family trees, ladies and gentlemen. What does he do? He adopts us as his own children. Don't be uh, deceived by the word adopt as if it's, oh, it's just adoption. And I know those of you, I have friends who have adopted. You, you, don't, don't, you, you don't say that. As parents, when we have kids that we give birth to, right, we, like, I know you want to say really because that's going to mess that up too, but adopted is just as good as being born. It's the same thing. Just as good as being in his family tree. This is what Jesus does. John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So it is a new family and a new creation in Christ. And when I came to Christ, I, that's what I needed. Absolutely. And then I began to see God move actually in my family. And it was really cool because I became united with people who were already in the family of Christ in my family, and those are my closest family members now because we're already part of this other family, right? We have our, that's, it's great. So it's a new genesis in him. It's an eternal family. We're made complete and whole. We can find rest in him. You can find forgiveness for your sins. And one day, all things will be made new. And that's when he returns. And in the meantime, all who enter in, whether Jew or Gentile, they are adopted into this final family, 
and they are brought under the rule of the final king. Because that's it. Once, once Jesus' name hits that genealogy, as far as ruling, that's it. it, it that, it's, it's complete. It's finished. Remember, the promise to David was an eternal throne. So Matthew, he kind of, I mean, he snuck that into the numbers. It's kind of hard to miss. Like I said, it's not a secret thing, but I guess it's pretty cool. 14, three 14s, 14 is 7 plus 7. So each 14 is a pair of 7 generations. He gives us three sets of 14 generations, which gives us a total of six sevens. And the seventh seven, seven, seven is Jesus. That's pretty awesome. It means complete. It means in him, we are in his generation that never ends. His family will never be broken. You have a broken family? Guess what? In Christ, you don't have a broken family anymore. And he can even, he can even restore and take care of the broken one you have. We claim his lordship and we enter in. We can look back and celebrate Jesus' birthday this week, remembering he is not a myth or a legend. Now, I'm not anti-Christmas, okay? And I'm really careful in my discussion with these things because it can cause a lot. But Paul, he discusses this in uh, Romans 14, if I'm right, and other people's consciences bothering them about certain things, right? But the problem, the biggest problem I have, even though I, I love the arts, I love watching the movies and everything, is when we treat this story as if it's somehow just a legend or a myth. When these were historical records, these were things that actually happened, Jesus was actually born, the Son of God came down, not a myth, it's not a legend, born into a real family, conceived by the Holy Spirit, had a... That family, not him, but that family had a messed up or broken past. And he did that. To grow up, to die for us. I mean, show us how to live. Show us how to be dependent on the Father. All, all everything he showed us. Then rise again, proving, I mean, he just, he just kept proving himself over and over again. To save us from our messed up, broken past and to give us a new family. This new covenant, this new testament that starts with the genealogy, this new promise, this new creation has been paid for by his blood. Jesus said this is the new testament, my blood. And it started from a real family tree. So really, I, I gotta say it, it's the greatest Christmas tree of all. It's totally evergreen. Right? It's never, that's it. Never-ending life is found in the family tree of Jesus Christ. So maybe we'll look at Christmas trees differently. And I'll ask you today, let's just take 10 seconds and close our eyes this morning because I'm closing. Some of you are leaving today. Some of you are going to go be with families. Some of you are completely alone. Some of you have extremely broken pasts, trauma, violence, assault, pain, beyond measure. You can't even handle it. It keeps you up at night. Some have just been raised in, raised in a Christian home, but you feel like you're far from God. You don't really feel this family vibe, if I could say that that I'm talking about. It's very simple. You can enter in this morning. All you do is just acknowledge he's real. Trust in him. Ask him to come into your life. Ask him to rule and reign. Basically, what a sinner's prayer is about, should be about, is the heart making Jesus the ruler that he already is inside the depths of your heart. And the reality is, when you're doing that, you are bowing at the throne of heaven. 
and you are entering into a new family. You receive his forgiveness. You're made new. You may, you're made whole physically. You're going to be, um, yeah, you're going to be the same for a while because we have something else to look forward to. But you are made whole in relation to the kingdom. And you have a ruler for your life that surpasses every bad leader in your family, in your job, in your government, whatever you've had that leaders have let you down. Jesus is the best leader for your life. So this morning, I'm not, you don't even have to raise hands. That's what you need to do in the depths of your heart. And today you can be a part of a new family. It's a decision some of us made a long time ago. And we will gladly say, those of us who know him, there's nothing else like it. So if that's you this morning, just cry out in the depths of your heart. And we're going to pray. Father, I thank you for all of those who are pondering your truths this morning, pondering the real meaning of the season, Lord, which is you, which is Christmas, which is more than a season. Yes, it's a lifestyle, yes, but it is a new family, a new tree that we're grafted into, Lord, that we're adopted into as your children for you to rule and reign. This morning, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would touch hearts who are opening to you now that you would restore what has been broken, Lord, in their lives. That you would touch the broken family trees that we have, Lord. That even those gathered here would be the catalyst for revival in their families, Lord. That we would be used to restore, to heal, to set free the captives, and do all those things that after you were born and after you grew up, which it's awesome that you did that. Thank you, Lord. But you commissioned us to do something, and that's at the end of Matthew, that we would go out into all the nations and proclaim your kingdom and make disciples, make adopted sons and daughters for your glory. Let it start with us at this time, Lord, this Christmas, as we center our lives on you. Lord, bless everyone who's gathered today. I pray blessings over family trees. Lord, I pray that you restore what the enemy has stolen, what the locust has eaten, and that your Holy Spirit would ignite our households, invade our, even our gift exchanges and our family fellowship, that we wouldn't let a moment go by without acknowledging and anticipating you and your glory from a manger, Lord, to the cross, to a resurrection and an ascension and a soon, very soon coming that we can anticipate like children. Bless those gathered here today. Be with us as we travel. And all God's people said, amen. Merry Christmas. Thank you for joining us.